the, government, the federal government, through the PMRA, when they did the label, they put, they put the pesticides through these lenses to figure out what precautions need to be taken. So what would pop up on a label as a result of this? A buffer zone between where you're applying and an open waterway. Don't apply if it's over this temperature. Don't apply if it's this windy. Don't apply, don't apply, don't apply, don't apply. So you can see how this all works. So what happens to pesticides when we let them out into the environment? Okay, this summary starts on page 92 and then goes into more detail. Okay, I'm just going to give you these words so you understand the concepts behind them. The important thing to know is that all pesticides given enough time will break down. We call it degradation. It's the opposite of persistence, if you like. <laughs> the most common way that pesticides break down is microbial degradation. Little microbes actually eat the pesticides, food, digest them, and they're gone. Chemical degradation is the most second common one. There's all kinds of chemical reactions that go on. We think of the soil as being pretty inert, but it's not. There's all kinds of chemistry that goes on there. Chemistry in the water, chemistry in the air, and they react with other things and they break down. And then lastly, photo degradation. Ultraviolet light is really hard on pesticides. It breaks them down really, really quickly. Bioaccumulation is another word we need to understand. Bioaccumulation is the buildup of pesticides in tissue. Okay, these are pesticides that either break down really, really slowly, or we can't break down. We store them usually in our fatty tissue or in our brains or in our central nervous system. Okay? There's not that many pesticides in your body will store. We'll talk about them in a few minutes, but there are some pesticides that will build up. And when they build up, we call that bioaccumulation. Biomagnification is when that bioaccumulation magnifies up the food chain. So you've got some little, little microscopic dealies that have eaten a bunch of pesticides and have a little bioaccumulation, and some bugs come along and eat those. They eat a bunch of them, so they get a little bit more bioaccumulation. Then a fish eats a whole bunch of bugs, then a bigger fish eats a whole bunch of... This matters to us, of course, because we're at the top of the food chain. If it's amplifying up the food chain, it ultimately can come to us. Adsorption with a D. Just more words you need to know. By the way, let me tell you something else. If you take your manual, don't lose the page on you take your manual and go right to the back, see those sort of aquamarine pictures there? Or pages right there? That's a glossary of pesticide terms. All these terms are defined there as well. So if you want to find a word quickly and you don't want to have to go try and find it in the manual, don't forget that that's there as well. But adsorption with a D means it's binding onto the outside of a particle. D for dirt, because that's usually what it's binding onto. Okay, so if I've got a little particle of sand here, my pesticide is bound onto the outside of it. It's not necessarily good or bad. If I'm in Simcoe and it's a sandy soil and I get a heavy, heavy rain, it's not going to leach down, right? Because it's bound on. However, if I get a big windstorm and that sand blows away, it goes with it. So not necessarily good, it's not necessarily bad, it's just a fact. <coughs> absorption is when it moves in. Okay, it's absorption like a paper towel. Pesticides on the outside and it goes into something. Again, might be good, might be bad, depends on the pesticide. Volatility, simply how likely the pesticide is to evaporate. Okay, you take a pan of water and put it on the ground, it turns into steam and drifts away. Put gasoline on the ground in a pan. It evaporates and the fumes go away. But we all know that the fumes have all the same properties as the liquid, right? But we can't control them anymore. Same problem with pesticides. If you put a pesticide down and it evaporates, you can't control where those fumes go. And we call that vapor drift. When the pesticides evaporate off the leaves and drift away. Spray drift is the stuff you can see. Vapor drift you can't, it just evaporates and goes. Spray drift is if you're spraying when it's way too windy, and you can actually see the pesticide blowing away behind you, which I would hope you would all stop if you saw that. Surface runoff is another way the pesticides can get in the environment. The water rushes across after heavy rain, washes some soil away, takes a pesticide with it, washes the pesticide, leaves the soil, depending on whether it's adsorbed or not. Leaching is simply when it moves down through the profile. Okay? So those are all different ways that pesticides can move. Soil erosion, pesticides can go with it. What we really want to talk about here, here, though, is environmental hazards. We need to protect the water, the soil, and the air. Okay? It's good land stewardship. My grandfather was on the Middlesex County Land Stewardship Committee. He preached this as long as I can remember. My dad did the same. It's all about land stewardship. Leaving that farm in as good a condition as you've got it, or better if you can. The soil, the water, the land, and the air. All of us try and do this. I, I would say that farmers are probably the best environmentalists of any group of people I've ever met. Because it's bred into you from the word go that this is my land, as a steward, not so much my land to exploit. And farmers just fundamentally look at their properties differently than, say, people who own golf courses. Okay? The people who own farms tend to look at it this way. And as a result, we have a good attitude about this. We also need to protect non-target species. We don't want to be killing things that we don't want to kill, like bees. Okay? There's a bees app that tells you what we need to do to protect bees. There's lots of information in your book there about bees. 
You cannot apply insecticides where uh, crops are in bloom, in bloom. And this is not just to protect the beekeepers, this is for you. We've got a lot of crops, and if we don't have bees to pollinate, we're in a lot of trouble. Anybody ever been to northern Saskatchewan or Manitoba? There's a town in northern Saskatchewan called Tisdale, Manitoba, where Brent Butt came from, actually, the guy from Corner Gas. And you drive into Tisdale, okay? They grow, they still call it rapeseed instead of uh, canola up there. And they have all these beehives through the whole fields to do the pollination, right? And it says, Welcome to Tisdale, land of rape and honey. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> okay? So, the point is, these, this is a symbiotic relationship. You absolutely need to have both of these things to happen. So we need to protect our bees. Now, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that have happened over the last few years with respect to bees and bee kills. There's a lot of research, you know, that first they thought it was a virus, and then they thought it was a tree seed. And the truth is, there's, there's still, we got something from you in the last week about this, right? They're still, they're still trying to decide exactly what's going on with bees, but we're, we're having some real trouble with bees in Ontario. So you have a responsibility, if you're using insecticides, uh, to make sure that you know where the local, uh, I can't say that word, beekeepers, are and make sure that you, you communicate with them so that they can close their hives down so they can do what they need to do. Okay? Don't forget about the bees. They're on our side. 